You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts. We got a pretty cool guest. And yeah. we got some hardware, too. Yes, we do. And uh, this is this is really, I love the circles in this this industry. And if you don't know them directly, um, you know you have a mutual friend. And uh, and Ricky Folk, uh, is he's actually shopped here with Jake's. So I remember seeing him about a week or two, about two weeks ago. He was in shopping around. And our mutual friend is uh, Jeff Luger. And uh, and Ricky's going to tell us a little bit about he fished a uh, Bassmaster Open in Mississippi. Virginia Boy went down to Mississippi as a co-angler and showed him how it was done. Uh, but prior to that, um, we're gonna we're gonna have him introduce himself. He's from Shenandoah, Virginia, and talk a little bit about uh, growing up fishing and, and different things. And then then we'll go into this this Bassmaster Opens. And what I love about this too, off camera, hearing some of his stories, some of the backstories that you're not gonna hear anywhere mm-hmm. else, maybe um, is pretty cool. And so uh, thank you for coming in you're and uh, just. For our viewers, tell us who you are and and uh, what got you to this point where you're at today. Well, I'm Ricky Falk. Uh, my hometown is Shenandoah, Virginia. Uh, been fishing tournaments probably 30 years or so, and been in the Bass Nation and um, Fishers of Men, and I'm still in today. And uh, but started off fishing uh, the Bass Nation. Fished with Jeff Luger a lot. I don't know how many tournaments me and Jeff fished, and I followed him to the Classic twice. So got to experience that style of living. But, uh, and fished with Melvin Bowling and uh, Fishers of Men. But uh, right now, I mean, you know, it, it was an exciting trip to go to Mississippi, but leading up to that, you know, I always wanted to experience what it would be like to fish with a pro other than Jeff. So I had the opportunity, you know, with my career and everything, getting close to retirement, so things are getting paid off. So I decided to talk to Jeff, and he said, yeah, he said, sure. He said, you know, come on. He said, I think you'll have a good time. So I signed up and paid my down deposits for three tournaments, and, you know, Jeff moved to Texas, and me and him's pretty tight, so it was time for us to spend a little time together, too, other than fishing and just hanging out. So, anyway, fish, been fishing, fishing with me and all that for the last couple of years now with Melvin, and we made it to nationals, finished 33rd out of 188. Uh, this year, we've been doing pretty good. We got a first, second, I think a ninth and a twelfth, and we're second in points. Hmm. So hmm. That's uh, really good. But, yeah, I mean, it's – and and to be with as a co-angler, uh, like on Fishers of Men, you know, I can go from the back to the front mm-hmm. uh, to where in the opens you can only stay on the back. Mm-hmm. You can't go to the front. So that's a little bit different. Yeah. So, um, one but, thing about this, like not to interrupt you, but as you go into that, you know, he was telling us off camera and I didn't know this. So prior to going to this tournament though, you had a little accident that, that, uh, probably would have, it would have kept. And as soon as it has happened, like when you told me how soon ago that yeah. happened, like that, mo- there's not too many people that would have been able to fish. No. So no, November 9th, I extruded the two bones out of my left hand, my, my pinky and my ring Mm. finger, and it brought them out of the bottom. Mm. And I was in surgery for two and a half hours. And when I got, when I come to, I, I thought maybe my fishing career was over because I throw with my right hand and I hold the rod with my left. So I reel with my right hand. So, and if you don't, and what I have found out that Without these two fingers, the two fingers that I tore to pieces, you cannot grip anything. That controls your grip. So me and Melvin, my buddy back in Shenandoah, we were playing around with a rod one day, and 
he was holding the line. Plus, I think we had tied it to a cinder block, and we were trying hook sets. And I couldn't hold the rod. It would either fall out of my hands or so. And what I month never, is this? What month? What month is this? How this was November after? 9th. So November 9th was the accident. Yeah. And when are you ripping the center blocks? I'm. I started like in January playing around, okay. and then in February I found after therapy going to Harrisonburg Hand and Rehab, working with Kim and the girls down there. They were. They did an amazing job. Um, got me back to where I could grip again. Mm. So then I started. Then when season come around in March. You know, and we had our first couple of tournaments. I was finding out, you know, hey, I can hold on to a rod mm -hmm. from having good therapy mm -hmm. and actually doing the therapy at home too. Mm. Anytime you have a hand de therapy, you just can't go to therapy and, mm -hmm. and work with it. You have to constantly work at with it at home. It's a blessing that you kept your hand and you didn't oh, lose yeah. those fingers. And taking yeah. for granted what like what the use of things, and, like, yeah. we just take it for granted. Like you don't yeah. think about yeah. when it's working right, right. and then yeah. when something like that happens, exactly. And it's, Man, and to think in your mind, like for fish for thirty years, and to be fishing competitively for thirty yeah. years, not just fun fishing, and then all of a sudden think, man, this is this, yeah. is, you know, this is done. It's over with. Wow. Yeah. And the and I had just purchased my new boat wow. from Jeff, so <laughs> uh. so yeah. But uh, no, it was. You know, I've experienced a lot in my life, and um, you know, just just following a dream and and staying on the water practicing doing things you know trying other techniques mm -hmm. you know just trying to get there and then this ross barnett came and you know and i was just you know just thankful that i was still able to go mm -hmm. after my hand injury and and it's so what did you do to prepare for that tournament that you're getting ready to go into well just basically you know fishing practicing mm -hmm. um you know still going to rehab i'm still going to rehab today and this mm -hmm. happened back november 9th mm -hmm. so you know this was this tournament was in april so that didn't leave me many months right you know leading up to this and you know just spending time on the water mm -hmm. and you know it's been cold here and actually, the warm air down there actually made my hand feel better. But on day one, my third fish I caught, I did injure my hand. Mm. And um, actually, Justin Heimel, who I was paired with, actually landed that third fish for me because I was scared I wasn't going to be able to land the fish mm. with because I was holding the rod. So I held the rod here, and mm. I was like, do you mind getting it? So, So after that, went back to the house and took some leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I hadn't but, thought about uh, it as a co-angler when you go down. Are you pulling your own boat? Did you pull your own boat down yes. there for practice? I went down. And how long did you practice? Um, I got down there on Friday and I uh, before the tournament and, and practiced on Friday and practiced Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then we had to be off the water at Wednesday at 12 o'clock to go check in. Mm -hmm. So I was practicing – you know, trying to, you know, help Jeff, you know, find some, a better setup, which we found a good ordeal going for him. And, you know, um, so that made me feel good that I could help Jeff. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. but, uh, but yeah, so I got to pre-fish and Jeff was running his stuff. And then I was running some of my things and I had found some stuff up, up river or up lake that, I didn't figure Jeff was going to mess with, but mm -hmm. I had took him, you know, we had rode around and I'd showed him some places where I had caught fish. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, hmm. uh, and if you guys want, because I just whipped up all the stats here, just to give everyone at home some context. So Ross Burnett is about 33,000 acres. Smith Mountain Lake is about 26,000 acres. So it's almost the same size as Smith Mountain Lake. And then put how many boats you said on that sucker? 225. 225. And then from the pro side, just to give you an idea of how tight it was, day one, Lee Livesey got 25 pounds. Day two, it was 10, then 12. So mm. it wasn't like they were just like, mm. this is not Lake Fork where they're mm. just whacking on them every day. It was mm. tight, and mm. there's boat pressure going into this mm. thing. And, th and thank and consideration, if you look and you study Ross Barnett, 
your average depth at Ross Barnett is only six feet. It's really? like it, it's almost like a pond, right? Got a bowlish yeah. type of Plus shape. Plus, it has it. a marsh that a lot of people cannot navigate. Hmm. Really, you know, unless you know you, know you right. have the good graphs that we have today, and you know, mm -hmm. just idling your boat or trolling your boat mm -hmm. to get into some of those places up there. Them guys were trying to get to. So, mm -hmm. so like what Jared says, like, what was your thought process going into this? Did you, I mean, I meant, did you assume that it was going to be tight and highly pressured? Did you think it was going to be a whack fest? Where were you kind of going into it, driving to Ross Barnett? Well, I mean, you know, I got 13 hours of drive time. You got a lot to think <laughs> <Yeah>. about. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I studied you know, basically started off pre-fishing with my strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a dock guy. I like to skip. You know, I'm a chatterbait, spinnerbait uh, type of guy. Um, you know, every now and then I'll throw crankbaits. But a worm is something that I, I don't throw a lot of. But after seeing where I was fishing at, at day one, mm -hmm. I knew there wasn't but several baits that I was going to be able to throw. Mm. And with the pressure that I figured might be on the lake, I didn't think the moving baits were going to last long, mm -hmm. other than what Jeff was doing. Mm. So, um, hmm. and I wasn't in those type of areas, so mm. I was kind of, there wasn't a lot of people really throwing, I mm. saw moving baits mm -hmm. in the area that I was at. It was a lot of, you know, dragging. It was... People were throwing chatterbaits and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. I didn't see most of the people I saw catch fish were always, you know, on plastic mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I didn't see anybody dragging as slow as I was. Hmm. People were throwing, you know, Cinco's with tail spinners and, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, you could tell they were winding some kind mm -hmm. of worm, like a speed worm, you mm -hmm. know, with the tail, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, is it because it's is, is dragging stuff through lily pad stems and grass? Is that just because people don't have the patience to do it? Because it like growing up on the tidal Potomac stuff, like you know, like mm -hmm. fishing pad stems. I mean, you even talked about the chick, but that's what mm -hmm. you guys did. Mm -hmm. Is it just a culture thing that out near Ross Bennett, people just don't do that, or is it a patience thing? Like, what what are your thoughts? Well, I would I think the reason why a lot of people that wasn't doing it um, is because maybe it's not one of their strongest techniques. Mm -hmm. I okay. think, yeah. You know, that makes sense. when you, I think most of the guys that fish, even the pros, I mean, they're so versatile at what they do, but they still have that strength, you know, that they have that they can fish with. So mm -hmm. normally that's probably what the average guy mm -hmm. is going to start with mm -hmm. is what he's comfortable with and mm -hmm. his confident baits. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's interesting too, I got to think, it doesn't matter how much you practice. I mean, it does matter, but the point being is you, you draw, you're a co-angler, so you draw a boater. Mm -hmm. And you know you're at their mercy. Yeah. You know, day one, no day two, shaped up a little different for you. But uh, maybe talk about that, like who you drew and, and where you guys ended up fishing to start off the tournament day one. Well, I, I drew a um, uh, a guy by the name of Justin Heimel. He's from Southern Louisiana, and um, we fished the the East Side Flats on Ross Barnett, which is the main body of water, but getting into those spots was the hairy thing mm. because you had a lot of stumps. Mm. So you had to find channels mm. to get in there. So we got in there and I saw what Justin was doing. So that's when I decided to make a change and I slowed my presentation mm. down. Mm. I started dragging my worm real slow and I was th throwing a Zoom Ultra Vibe and I was concentrating in between the black and red and the June bug color because of the water and the lake had been blown out. Okay. It had, it was muddy everywhere. Mm. And um, but come tournament day, when we got to Justin's first spot, when I fish, I'm I like to be look around a lot at what mm -hmm. other people were doing, and I just noticed that. Where we were fishing, it was a real small creek feeding that come out from behind us. And if anybody knows that when a bass are on beds, they use them little creek channels mm. to filter into a flat and then they roll off the sides and mm. spawn. If you got lily pads, you got hard bottoms. Mm -hmm. So they're going to spawn around the lily pads. Mm -hmm. 
and out in front of it was hydrilla. <laughs> well, a little funny thing about where we was at is, you know, as I was casting around and out in front of the hydrilla right off to the edges of the creek channels was shell beds. How did and you figure that out? I felt it. That is so freaking I felt cool. It. I felt the shell beds when I was dragging. And I said something to Justin about it. And see, I caught two of my fish off the shell beds and I caught one out out uh, from the lily pads that we were catching. But but Justin, he was throwing a worm with a tail, a Cinco with a tail spinner on it. And he had it pegged and he had it pegged. And um, he was bringing it through the lily pads because they were scattered. And he went, to, he went to whacking them. He ended up having five fish. And, um, but I, t I said something to him, so we moved out a little bit further. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he didn't have power poles, so he was carrying an anchor, and he would drop it off the side and tie it to the center of the boat. That's freaking awesome. The wind was blowing. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so, well, he had an express, because down in Louisiana, uh, where okay. they fish. But mm. uh, hmm. so... Um, so he he started he got out there and he felt it too and he was like hmm and then he caught one. So that was made me think. So as we were fishing on day one, I'm just watching, and we got about fifty boats on this flat. And hmm. it's the Potomac River, or is this <laughs> well? I'll, I'll, I'll tell flat. you what. I was telling him earlier. <laughs> I have two words, and I actually figured out what these two words are in the professional fishing. It's called respect and character. Respect is family. Character is friendship. Mm -hmm. Because even though, you know, when them guys have them jerseys on, they, they have them on for one reason, and that's business. Mm -hmm. But when they take them jerseys off, they're just like you and me. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a, my first crawfish brawl, and it must have been 30 pros. I'm talking Lee Levesey was there. Jeff Luger was there. Uh, Chad Petro was there. Uh, Blake Sylvester was there. He's the one that actually got the crawfish. And and uh, Alan Latuso was there. Alan Nail. Uh, Clark Ream. Wow. You know, just a lot of guys like that. And mm -hmm. they were just like you and me. I mean, mm -hmm. so, and that respect is what I meant by family. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they do it for a business, <laughs> when they get together like that, you know, they're, mm -hmm. it's all about friendship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Kamor was there. I got to meet Kamor, the one, the one, the James, you know, and I mm -hmm. told him, you know, you did a good job at the James, mm -hmm. you know, shook his hand. But, uh, but yeah, so. And then, you know, the, on I think it was on Monday or Tuesday, we had a storm roll in. And at the boat landing where me and Jeff was putting in, a lot of the pros were too. And, right, and the wind was blowing right into the boat ramp. Well, most of your pros are by themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you got 30, 35 mile an hour wind blowing right in, you know, putting a boat on a trailer and it turns mm. sideways, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of hard when you're by yourself. Yeah. So I was seeing guys getting out of the truck, other pros to help other pros mm -hmm. help get themselves, you know, to help mm -hmm. out. And that's where character and friendship come along. Mm -hmm. You know, he could have sat in the truck and said, you know, oh, it's, mm -hmm. you know, if he tears his boat up, you know, or, mm -hmm. but, but he actually got out, hooked his boat up and ratcheted it up for him. Mm -hmm. so, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So that's... But it was a whole learning experience. And then on day two, I got I got paired with Chad Murray. And when you get paired... You, how, where were you sitting? Where were you? How much weight did you have after day one? I had seven and a half pounds after day one, and I was setting 16. 16. Yeah. So you got, you got 16 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Uh, out of 225. Yep, yeah, out of 225. And the guy that with was seven leading, pounds. I had seven wow. and a half pounds. And, and with, with those seven, with those three fish, did you catch them early in the day? Was it scattered? Like, no, was it, it was just three bites? The first day was scattered. Okay. I mean, I caught my third fish at like two something. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. That's freaking and We nuts. had to be in at 430. Wow. But wow. see, we launched at six. Okay. But now you take 
we were boat uh, 161. Jeez. So and did you had, did you lock one bait in your hand the whole day and said, I'm just going to live and die with this? Well, was there audible? The you first made? day I was trying different things, mm -hmm. but after I caught the first fish, my brain stopped. It said, whoa, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You ain't catching with nothing else. You need to go back with what you caught that first fish with. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I went back to that, and then I caught my second off mm -hmm. of it. I had seven rods with me, mm -hmm. and I probably didn't need but one rod. And that's something. And well, if I may go back to one thing that you mentioned, which I think the audience would like, is you said you're fishing in a crown of like a billion people, and you were being you weren't just dialed into the water; you were observing everybody yeah. else. I was observing everybody else, and I was observing where other people were fishing, because I had in my pre-fishing I had not fished in that area, but I was above that area. Mm -hmm. So, and I had caught fish there, and then across the lake I'd caught them. Um, on a spinner bait, mm -hmm. and but I'd also caught them dragging a worm, but I wasn't locked into that. Sure. So, but I wasn't locked into the dragging of the worm till after day one, and then um, what on, made you lock into it? Was it just seeing what other people were what doing? Other people were doing um, because the only guys I saw that mm -hmm. was catching fish around us was mostly on plastic. And this fish, this rod's just doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Now, I did see guys throwing other things because you can tell, you know, when somebody's doing something, if the, mm -hmm. the handle's turning, mm -hmm. you know, you're throwing something moving. Just like Justin was throwing the Cinco, you know, and he was winding it and, and had a mm. spinner on it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I think he was doing that because of the pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, pressure and boots, boats moving around in that area, stirring up the mud and stuff, made me slow down mm -hmm. because I knew these fish were were going to beds and I knew they were coming off because me and Jeff had done already figured that out, mm -hmm. you know, early in the week. And um, that is so, because, so I, I grew up fishing like BFLs on, in the Potomac River where it's just, there's a thousand people in this thing. And it's so interesting that that other mind game is you're not just, it's not just like you and the fish. It's also, you do need to strategize mm -hmm. like that and look around. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's fish probably here. This is the juice. Mm -hmm. Well, what do I do that's a little different to mm -hmm. trigger them or, or to mm -hmm. make it work? Yeah. Um, I get one observation there. Like what, I know when I'm fishing the Potomac, it's like a traffic jam on 95. People are so close. Yeah. Was there, how much space were pros giving themselves? Boats well, to boats? Well, a rule like, of thumb with bass is 50 yards. 50 yards, okay. But what was, what was weird is, is you had all them people together and out of respect for each other, like we were talking about, mm -hmm. there was no controversy. That's hmm. impressive. Wow. I mean, you know, because everybody knows, you know, mm -hmm. this is where I'm fishing. You right. know, I pre-fished here. You know, you're not going to, you know, you go to the Potomac and you get on a grass patch and you might have 10 boats around it. Mad Max mm -hmm. Fury Yeah, Road. it's Mad Max, and, you know. <laughs> And flip each other a sandwich, and you know somebody's <laughs> gonna get in an argument. But right. you know, the these guys just know how to mm -hmm. control themselves, mm -hmm. and you know they're they know they're gonna be around each other. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's true. You know they they just do keep it, working and, and grinding. They just yeah. keep working and grinding, and they're doing gonna do mm -hmm. something different to mm -hmm. to prevail. So after so you, you yeah. finish day one, and you're um, seven pounds, sixteenth place. And then I'm, you know, I'm thinking too. Again, it's not like you're going back with the same guy. You're drawing a whole different yeah. boater. And then what, what did you take from in that time period before you get back on the water the next day, going into day two? How do you do? You have to change some things up, or what yeah. are you you're still researching? Well, yep. Well, I had lost some fish on day one, and and it was and when guy had told me that you know he said, well, I, yeah, I seen you down below us. He said you were having some funky hook sets and. <laughs> And which I was because of my hand, you know, mm -hmm. I can't really hook like I normally want to. So, and I had lost some fish, but I was throwing, dragging my worm on a six four one reel. Mm -hmm. So I got to thinking, okay, how can I keep from losing these fish? Because when I was setting the hook, they would take off running. Some of them was coming at me and I couldn't catch up. Hmm. So I changed my reel combination to an eight three one. Wow. Smart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I speeded my line. That's reel next up. level. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, so when I got got the email or got the text from Bass that says who I was being paired with, I actually called and his name was Chad Murray. 
great guy. I mean, just like Justin. I mean, you know, they were great guys to fish with. Um, you know, my hat's off to both of them. But Chad, when I talked to him on the phone, he didn't weigh a fish in on a, on Thursday. So he said, look, if you have anything you want to do, I'm game to go because he said, you're setting up, you know, mm -hmm. 16th. He said, you know, we catch you one fish, you know, you'll be guaranteed a check. That's so, great. That's cool. So I had, while I was fishing on day one, <clears throat> I had been being observant above us mm -hmm. where I had been mm -hmm. pre-fishing okay. and practice and I'd found this spot. So I, when I got paired up with Chad the next morning, we, he uh, opened up his, his mapping and I showed him exactly where I wanted to go. And he said that he was fine with going there. He said, uh, he said, the boat is yours. He said, you know, you can't come to the front, but you know, he said, we'll do whatever you want to do. And I told him, I said, well, I want to go in here and I want to set the boat right here. And I want you to put it this way and power pole down. So after we got up and set up, we wasn't there 45 minutes and I laid into my first one and it's over five pounds. Wow. How many boats were around? Would you have it to yourself? Oh, or was no, it traffic no, jam? it was still a bunch around. Yeah. Yeah. And good for him too, because being that boater, you yeah. know, and, and obviously he hadn't caught any fish, so it's to his advantage too probably to kind of get inside your brain, but uh, he doesn't have to do that either. No, so, he I mean, doesn't. That's off yeah. to him to, yeah. to uh, be a team player on that. And, yeah. And is that the exception or the norm? Like when you're dealing with these open uh, uh, pro anglers, is that generally how they how they're like, or, or what is it? Well, you know, from and I can only exp give you from what I experienced because this is my first one. Okay, okay. Um, this is only the first open I've ever done. So um, hopefully down the road there'll be many more now. Mm -hmm. So, um, but no, I mean. And the thing, I don't know if, if Chad did it because, you know, he wanted to see a different style right. or a different body yeah. or, you know, because what he had going on Thursday, he had lost water up. They had mm. run a lot of water out mm. of that place gotcha. up there in the marsh. His right. areas were just gone. There wasn't no water there. Yeah. And it, it might've like been the different, tide went out. Yeah. And it might've been a different story too. If he was sitting in, you know, 20th or, or had fish, he yeah. might've, you know, but well, I mean, either even, way, yeah. though, you're, he sets you up. Yeah. To, I mean, even Justin, I mean, compared mm -hmm. to like when I tried to be a co-angler at like a BFL again, mm -hmm. it's like my experience was not necessarily great, but it sounds like most of these guys, they treat you, they're very polished and professional mm -hmm. and, and how they, yeah. they deal with their co-anglers. But, but on day two, after I caught the first one, um, I mean, because me and Tad, Chad talked all day long, and and um, and he said, he said, well, you, you'll be fine now. He said, you'll get a good check. So I got to thinking in my head, all right, here we go. I got, I done caught the leader now, or I passed him. I got two fish yet to catch, and he's got three. Mm -hmm. So I said, all I got to do is catch one more and I'll get, maybe get a little better check. Mm -hmm. So I caught the second one and this one's two and a half, two and three quarters. So T Chad tells me, he said, well, go ahead and send in, you know, you got seven and a quarter to bass tracks. And, you know, so I did that. And so, uh, Ooh, I, I, so I, I've always curious, how does that work? Bass track? Do you just send a text? Do you yeah. Call they somebody send like you a text and you just punch in. And what they want you to do is you punch in like one fish. It'd be seven point, two five for two fish you put two uh, but they want the seven or the eight let's say you got like lee levisey he punched in if he did bass tracks uh you know five fish for two mm -hmm. oh point zero zero pounds okay because see everybody has the you know the 7.06 or okay. 7.60. Or, Do they confirm or can you be like, yeah, I caught three for 30 pounds and then be like, that's fine. And they send it. Are they like, do they check back with I'm you? Honored. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, no, no. Because I mean, you know, most of the guys today, if you watch, you know, on the TV, most of the guys They're are weighing scale. Fish. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. those scales that they have out now are pretty accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's cool. Okay. I so, never knew how that yeah. worked. Huh. So any, anyway, we're sitting there and it's, I don't, I don't know exactly what time it was, but I think I looked at my clock and I still had my line out. I didn't pull my phone out to see what time it was and I still got my line out. And it was at 9.35 and Chad says, well, I think I'm going to 
power pole up and just spin the boat and move up about 20 yards. I said, well, that's fine. So when he spins the boat, we know he, my line no sooner tightens up and I pull just a little bit and pow, I get hit. <laughs> I get this one in and uh, it's almost four pounds. Mm. And uh, Chad looks at me and he said, you done won this thing. <laughs> I was like, what? He said, you've done one the coal angler side, I think. That's awesome. I was like, no. I said, <laughs> he said, no. He said, what you don't realize is today is moving day. These pros are going to be probably a little more stingier with their co-anglers because if they're right outside that cut to make a check, they're going to, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. do their best. Mm -hmm. So he said, you're probably going to see less co-anglers with fish today. And he said, you've done caught uh, over 11 pounds. And he said, uh, you don't mm -hmm. kick my rear end from the back of my boat. So... <laughs> And that you know, probably doesn't happen very often. No, they don't like, happen too the often. The weight's just so guys. freaking tight. I mean, yeah. you have guys here that, I mean, guys that finished in the top, like like Adam Timms finished sixth, and he had one fish for two pounds, and that got him up there, whatever, three fish mm -hmm. limit. So it didn't take much to do well, mm -hmm. like to begin with on, on the last day, just to kind of fact, like just to back what you said there. Um, that's just, that's crazy. That's really yeah. crazy. Yeah. So. And this is still like, is this still 930 in the yeah. morning, you said? Well, yeah. I have my limit at, at uh, 940. Wow. So Makes the rest of the day a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying to... Okay, know, I want to know that your head space. Where, yeah, where are my you head, at? My head's going... I mean, Chad's done filled my head, you know. And now I'm thinking, <laughs> he might be right. Now, what's the odds of this happening? Mm. You know, I'm down here hanging out with Jeff and all them guys. First time I've ever been on open. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to win this thing? Mm -hmm. I was like... Dude, that was too good to be true. Yes, <sighs> yeah, you know. So, and it, but it's not over yet either. No, no, the other I, side of that, other side I still is got saying, eighty percent oh, of the day. Yeah, yeah. Don't, you don't yeah. know. So I send check. Uh, I send Jeff a text, and, and and in that text, I told him I said, Jeff, I got a limit. I got over eleven pounds. These guys better have them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Um, so, you know, normally I didn't figure Jeff was going to text back, but I just wanted to let him know, you know, I had a limit mm -hmm. because, you know, he, me and him had done talk because I got paired with a, mm -hmm. you know, a guy that didn't catch fish on zero. And I was mm -hmm. like, Jeff, I'm, you know, and, but, you know, I was kind of concerned because I'm setting 16th, you know, I don't know what this guy's going to do. But then after the phone call, I was kind of relieved mm -hmm. because he had told me, he said, well, we'll just go do what you want to do. If yeah. You got something. Yeah. And, you know, and then, because Jeff had told me, he said, man, don't worry. He's, you know, just because he hasn't caught no fish, mm -hmm. you know, that don't mean he won't put you on mm -hmm. something. He said, mm -hmm. because. It actually set up better for you, yeah, sounds like. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, plus, you know, Jeff had been encouraging me all week, you know, because mm -hmm. I'd never done this before mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to expect. And Jeff said, look, you can catch fish behind me. You can catch fish mm -hmm. behind anybody. Wow. Was so, you was this your first time being a co angler, period, or yeah. just at this level? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Because normally, I mean, the tournaments we've fished, you know, I haven't been able to go to the front deck. So just think about, mm -hmm. you know, 30 years of, or the years I've been fishing, mm -hmm. you know, I've had access to the Free front run, of the, rain mm -hmm. of the boat, yeah, rain of the boat, positioning and, and being able yeah. to go. Call and the now, shots. Yeah. And now you're cut off to your, to mm -hmm. your seat. Mm -hmm. and back so the only time you can go to the front of the boat you can't take a fishing pole but if the guy you know is in trouble or mm -hmm. if he needs a hand with his boat or interesting you know if it's the wind is blowing or something like an that, emergency you, emergency mm -hmm. or keep something the boat like that. out of yeah, a, yeah keep the boat out of a tree situation or, or dock or something to save his boat you know okay you're able mm -hmm. to do that but mm -hmm. you can't you can't have a fishing pole on the front mm -hmm. deck with you Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So I, I have so many questions about being a co-angler, but first I just want to kind of finish this day out. Yeah. So um, you get in and you have, have to you caught, you didn't. Yeah. Those yeah. were the final fish you weighed into. Ones? You didn't yeah. call out or anything after no, that? No, those fish no that, was, that was the only three fish I caught. I caught shorts and stuff like the rest that. Rest of the day. Rest of the day, mm -hmm. but I couldn't catch nothing to upgrade. So when my brother and I, when my brother and I had a really good finish in college and then when I won an ABA, both times what sucked is we were the, like the first ones to weigh in. 
So we had to deal with that the whole time. I need to know your yeah. headspace okay. Here through we... this whole thing. Yeah. Okay, so you get All up right. there. So I get up there and see the the order is flip flop. So we're in we're fifth flight. Okay. Or no, sixth flight. And Jeff is in fifth flight. So, or vice versa. I can't remember what it was, but uh, anyway. So we got to come back early because oh, we got to be back at. Uh, I think it, our way in was two fifty. That's when our oh way my in goodness, was. you're one of the early ones. Yeah, oh. one of the early ones. So <laughs> anyway, so I don't know if Jeff decided to wait on me or what, but for some reason Jeff hadn't weighed fish yet, so mm -hmm. we just walked together, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thank him for that because, you know, it's nothing like hearing when I went up on stage and Jeff was down there at the tank, you know, and it says, Ricky Falk, you just taken over the lead on the oh, co angler wow. side. Oh, wow. And where was your head at? It was just, you know, and then a guy throws a mic <laughs> yeah. in your face, you know, and now you're trying to figure out what to say, you know, and, um, but, you know, the experience of having Jeff there was just the best. That's mm -hmm. good, yeah. I mean, you Somebody know, your best buddy, to yeah. share it with. Yeah. And, because he had talked about leaving and, and going, starting mm -hmm. to go home, and mm -hmm. he said, nah, I need to stay for Ricky, you know, mm -hmm. just to be there for him, you know, mm -hmm. if he wins this thing, even if he gets second. Yeah, you know, still it's just, a great finish, it, It's yeah. still a great finish. That's well, a good time, friend. It's so. a real yeah. good friend. Yeah, so, but, uh, but, yeah, so, anyways, they tell me, they say, well, I'm leading, you know, and I help, I hold up two of my biggest fish, mm -hmm. probably see that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he said, don't go nowhere. He said, you're probably going to get a check. But he said, if we're going to put you on the hot seat when the last two flights mm -hmm. come. So that's such so a I'm, lonely place to be. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you know, I'm here I go. I'm, I'm sitting on the hot seat. Mm -hmm. it, and it must have been, I'm Forever. telling you, the whole fishing day must have went by. <laughs> Because I'm sitting there, you know, and guys are coming up and oh coming God. up and coming up. Co-anglers are coming up, and, you know, and then we get to the last guy. And, oh and he, uh, the guy running the way in he tells the guy that checks in your fish to move him to the back of the line. Because I had heard him talk to him. So, um, so anyway, I took a glance when they moved him. And when he picked his bag up, I knew it was thin, but I didn't know, you know, I kind of felt like, oh man, I don't want this thing, I think maybe. It's such a weird, it's like, it's like yeah, but I don't uh, know for sure, because yeah, I don't yeah, know, coming, you know. Yeah. So anyway, they bring him up and we're standing there, you know, and, you know, I tell the guy, you know, I wish him luck, you know, mm -hmm. for the best and, you know, whatever mm -hmm. comes of it, mm -hmm. you know, I'm happy. If he yeah, wins, sure. he wins. If mm -hmm. I win, I win, you know. Yeah. So anyway, the guy weighs in a two pound something and I win. Wow. And it just like kind of sinks in. Yep. I yeah. yeah. I've just done it. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. But but what was funny is mm -hmm. uh right before we weighed the fish in, he, he before he brought the guy up, he he looked at me and he said, Well, Ricky, you want to keep on talking or you want to weigh fish? I said, Well, we can talk all day if you want, <laughs> but uh I'd much rather just go ahead and weigh them fish. <laughs> so yeah, that was but it, the whole thing was just a great experience. A great experience, yeah. something new. I mean, and to experience it the way I did, mm. you know, only thing I can tell anybody, any younger kids out there, you know, find a technique, find confidence in, mm. in that technique and fish with it mm. and then broaden. Mm. You know, don't watch all these shows and go out and buy all this stuff. Find a bait that you're confident in, whether it be a chatter bait, mm -hmm. a spinner bait, mm -hmm. you know, a Carolina rig or something. Mm -hmm. Find that confident bait first, and then go from there. And it, I, I'll also say, I'm I'm sorry, yeah, like yeah. like be observant. Like that's such a yeah. thing. Like mm -hmm. I, it, out of all the people we've interviewed mm -hmm. and kids we've talked to, doing the simple thing of looking around, mm -hmm. and if everyone's rod tips down doing this, that mm -hmm. should clue you in. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I could just do mm -hmm. that. If it, it's working, it's so if it's not simple. And what are, what can I do to his yeah. point? That's not, I don't see anybody pulling fish out. So I got to do something a little yeah. different than everybody else is doing. Yeah. And uh, I got to say too, Ricky, I mean, it's one thing, if you'd have gone out and won, let's say on the James, or, or let's say a body of water that you're in Virginia, yes. your yes. home water, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's still an accomplishment mm -hmm. because 
you know, anytime you're competing against 225 anglers and you're number one, I don't care where you're at. That's great. But, but to do it on the home water is one thing, but to go to Mississippi, having never fished that body of water yeah. and you're not in your backyard mm-hmm. and to go down there with, with those guys that some, a lot of guys that are with the opens, a lot of your, a lot of your guys, backyard guys are there fishing. Mm-hmm. And for you to go down and do that in their backyard, I mean, hats off to you, man. That's, yes. that, that's just another win's it's a impressive. win, but that's a, a higher impressive win Was in my hard? mind because yeah. you went down there yeah. and did it in there. Was it heavier than you thought it would be? The trophy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I never, I didn't think it was going to, you know, I didn't think it was going to be nothing like this. You know, I thought it was going to be, you know, just a little plaque or something yeah. like that. You know, I, I've never, you know, s- seen a co-angler yeah. trophy. And then when I was, because Jeff, when we went to, uh, it's funny, uh, when we went to go sign in on Wednesday, Jeff said, there's, a tr- there's your trophy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like. Wow, that thing is big. Yeah. You know, it was almost as big as the, yeah. you know, the pros. Pro, uh-huh. But uh, that's but funny. yeah. So, but no, I got a, uh, you know, just hats off to, you know, Jeff. All the years we fished together, and Melvin Bowling, times we spent together fishing, and mm-hmm. um, you know, and his family, and and Jeff and Linda in Texas. You mm-hmm. know, it's just, you know, we when you got a good group of people and you hang around with, you know, you learn from each other. And That's so. awesome. Let me, I want to, I did want to ask a question too, because, and you're right. And you can learn. And I was talking earlier, I, you know, I learned a lot from Jeff. I uh, didn't fish with him a lot, but I learned a lot, you know, from listening to him talk. What is one thing that you learned from Jeff in fishing? And, and what's one thing that you think maybe you taught him over the years? Well, I'd say me and Jeff, taught each other we're always confident with each other mm. we you know we always when we did fish together you know it was always i would pre-fish and he would pre-fish and then we would ca- clash mm-hmm. heads and try to put a plan together mm-hmm. and uh but you know i think me personally just you know over jeff's years just giving him confidence mm. You know, and just us being there for mm-hmm, each other, mm-hmm. you know, is, but as far as the fishing, um, you know, you know, we always joke, you know, I could say a lot about Jeff, but we'll just keep that. <laughs> I was going to ask you too. I was going to throw you on the, bu- or not, no. not the bus. I was going to put you on the spot and say, who's the better angler? <laughs> well, you all went head to head. Well, that day. No, Jeff's going to no. watch you. But. Yeah. J- j- you know, I'll give Jeff eight out of 10 shots. <laughs> I got to get in there a little bit. All right, you know. yeah, you get your engine. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I got to get my revenge. But uh, but yeah, no, no. Jeff's a good fisherman. I mean, he, I'd say, you know, he improved and showed me some things mm-hmm. on the chatterbait. Mm. And uh, plus, you know, all the years of some of the places, you know, you know, when Jeff come down here from Ohio, mm-hmm. you know, just being there for him and showing him some of these lakes and areas gotcha. and stuff and then he progressed out of it gotcha. but uh um interesting you know it's just i don't know about jeff you know what i what we done for each yeah. other was just mm-hmm. being there for yeah, each that's other. cool that's cool that is good yeah yeah as far as the baits um you know i he probably taught me more than i could probably say i showed yeah. him anything but um you know just that's a good answer. But like, yeah, being, you know, helping each other. It's yeah. not always a competition, yeah. you know. It yeah. is, and like you said, too, that's what's great about this sport, too. Like you said, when when you can compete between the lines or on the water, mm-hmm. it, you're competing. Yeah. And yet off the water, you can, yeah. you know, step off the water. And now you're friends and you're going to yeah. you can share whatever, collaborate. Um, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. And before we take a, a, a small a small break, because I'm going to have to actually use the restroom and I'll edit this in post. Um, what are your top three suggestions or pointers you would give to somebody trying to be a co-angler? Now that you've been like you've been in the front of the boat and you got to experience this for the first time, what are your takeaways about like of doing it? Well, every night that like just before like the first day, mm-hmm. 
you you find out who you're paired with. Mm -hmm. So you make a phone call to that guy to see where you're going to meet. Mm. And you ask the guy. Mm. Now, whether he tells you um, what he's fishing, most of the time they do. So, okay. um, so Justin told me, you know, okay, we're going to, we're not going to be that far away from the ramp and uh, we're going to be shallow water. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're mm -hmm. going to be fishing, you know, lily pads and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So now you, in a process, you have to start thinking, okay, what kind of bag do I have to put mm -hmm. together? Mm -hmm. Okay. So my bag um, consisted of the ultra vibes. I knew I was going to throw worms. I mm -hmm. threw some topwater frogs in there, um, some chatter baits, my mm -hmm. spinner bait. The first day, you're basically going in there open minded, mm -hmm. but make sure you got, you say three, make sure you got three baits that you got confidence in. Mm hmm. How many rods are you allowed to bring, or can you bring as much or as well? Little as that's you wish? up to uh, Bass says you can take six, but both of my anglers told me I could take seven. Okay, uh, they didn't have a problem with me bringing seven because mm -hmm. you know, really, mm -hmm. seven rods you have to fight those seven rods, they don't because they're gonna be at your side. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, I had different rods for different gear ratios that because I had a crankbait and then. Um, then I had my chatter bait, which I like to throw a six four one. Mm -hmm. On my spinner bait, I like to throw a six four one. Um, top water is usually eight three one. Um, my worm normally is a six three one, hmm. which I found out that you better have an eight three one in the bag. <laughs> it's also as a spare reel if you don't have one. But, uh, but no, it's just putting things together and you know have everything you put in that bag make sure it's something you have confidence in mm -hmm. because that's great advice that's some really good advice yeah mm -hmm. don't put something in there you know just because you're fishing with a pro mm -hmm. um don't think just because he's throwing you know a 25 foot deep diving crankbait you know if he's in open water fish can you can find figure out different ways to catch fish, That's whether it be point. a shaky head. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I did not have a spinning rod. I did had no mind at all of putting a spinning rod in my hand. Hmm. Hmm. I, I took that out after I I saw the lake after day one. Hmm. Interesting, because I knew that the spinning rod. You know, I wasn't going to be fishing deep water mm -hmm. because the whole lake's not more than six feet. Mm -hmm. So you pretty much know you're going to be pi almost power fishing. Hmm. So, you know, you got docks, lily pads, you know, you know the spawn's going on. So you got to think about what you're going to put in that bag, mm -hmm. you know, what you think the fish are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, now if they're offshore, then, you know, you could throw a Carolina rig or something like that. But, you know, I didn't even think mm. about throwing a Carolina rig in two and a half feet of water because that's what we were fishing. Right. Interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, well, what was your setup? All right. I was throwing a G Loomis 840, a MBR 844. Um, I was throwing 15 pound big game line and I was using loose reels. And my setup was, if a lot of people don't know what an ultra vibe is, this isn't the exact color I was using, but I did, couldn't find it over. This is what an ultra vibe looks like, if you can see. And then I was throwing it with a Gamagatsu three-odd hook. And then I was using a bobber stopper and a quarter ounce tungsten weight. Hmm. And when I pegged it, I didn't peg my weight all the way. I kept a small gap because I didn't want fishing down in them pads and dragging it in the hydrilla. I didn't want that weight to lay against the knot on my hook. Mm -hmm. And by not pegging it tight gives you that, that weight to, to move freely. Mm -hmm. And that was my setup for the whole six fish I caught was on that one rod other than changing the reels on day two to an 831 lose uh, tournament pro series. Um, 
that was pretty much my whole setup. And I like that. We were talking off camera. The I like that setup too. When, when Brian Schmidt was here a couple of weeks ago, he was going over some of the some of his techniques, and and I was watching from back there. I was and he was up there showing it. I lo it looked like a swivel head, mm -hmm. and and I kind of was looking at it and then wasn't until afterwards and I walked up and looked it was identical to what you're talking about and he would peg that off and the other good thing not you're not but also when you allow that to come off a little bit it gives the it actually gives the bait some movement free interesting movement, movement you know side to side or up and down or whatever yeah. it's it, it almost it, it it is a swivel head is essentially mm -hmm. what it is because yeah. you've got a little bit of gap in there that's yeah. the same thing I, but, a fighter but does you that definitely too. need to get mm -hmm. you some of these if mm -hmm. you're to do that pegging mm-hmm that's so. re that's really really that yeah, wow. No, it, that's a good setup. Now, how, and so were you, and then how are you working that? Um, I know you talked about it before, but just kind of review again. Yeah. What? How do you work that? Well, what I was doing is, um, even though you're on a flat, I'm a type of person that when I cast, I got to have something to cast to. Okay. So I've either found something out there to cast to, or like I was casting at the lily pads. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't casting in an open water. Mm -hmm. Every time I cast, I was casting to something. Mm -hmm. uh, now, a lot of people fish open water and stuff like that, you know, uh, all the stuff might be under the On water. The bottom, yeah. But in order for me to know where that shell bed was, mm -hmm. when, I, when I found it, I found a landmark on the other side of the lake, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a tree or a house, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't have a graph. You know, I'm in the back of the boat, so I don't have access to graphs. So that's another good tip for a man in the back of a boat that when you cast a something and you catch a fish or you're casting at something, find a landmark. Great point. Find a landmark and concentrate on a landmark. That's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Even though you're left or right of it, mm -hmm. of your landmark, there might still be something there. Mm -hmm. So how, how slow do you, what is slow in that situation? You're there there is like, nothing too slow. <laughs> when you think you're not slow enough, you, you go slow. That feels like torture. My I God. mean, yeah. It no was, coffee. Take a set. Yeah. I mean, for two days of solid fishing down there at Mississippi, I mean, it was like, mm. I mean, it was, it was, it was killer. Mm. I mean, it was, you drag so slow that. You know, it might take two minutes to get your line back in. Oh. You're dragging so slow, mm -hmm. but now you're making long casts. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's that's. But that's the difference brutal. too. Sometimes yeah. when yeah. you don't slow it down, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to get bit, and that's why you come back. So I threw this, I threw that, and I made a comment. I, I realized again, I was fishing too fast. I need to slow down, yep. and it's mm -hmm. hard to do, yep. but. If you don't slow down, you may not get bit. But yeah. if the reaction bites on, then, then you yeah. everybody's catching. It, it don't matter. It don't matter. But, and here's another thing, too, that I, I run through my head the whole time I was dragging this thing slow is I knew these fish were on beds, mm -hmm. and some were off mm -hmm. beds. So just think, dragging that slow. Keeping the strike zone. Just keeping it in the strike mm -hmm. zone, whether you caught the edge of a bed, right, the middle, mm -hmm. you know, because a bass ain't going to leave it let let it sit there too mm -hmm. long. And I will tell you this. That's a good point. A lot of people don't understand this, but an, something about an ultra vibe, you throw an ultra vibe in a bed and leave it, it drives them nuts. That's hmm. the only bait I flip on beds hmm. is an ultra vibe. Is that why you decided to go with an ultra vibe versus a speed worm or, yep. or a salamander or something like that? Yep, because I mean, when I bed fish, it's usually a solid white okay. ultra vibe, mm -hmm. and it, my, I'll put red spike it on the on the tips. But I have for you, that's all I've ever bed fished with is an ultra vibe. Hmm. Interesting. And it's something about an ultra vibe that if you, I, I mean, if you can, even if you can't see it, but you can see the bed. If you flip it in there, just leave it sit. Mm -hmm. Just leave it sit because he ain't gonna like it there. Mm -hmm. He's gonna eventually move it. Hmm. Wow. That's the only thing I found. Everything else, they don't care. But that ultra vibe, mm -hmm. they will they will get it out of there. It's a good tip. When you're tournament fishing, and not just this tournament, but when you're bed fishing, and I'm thinking the title of the tournament with the James and everything, and you're blind fishing beds, 
I feel like your ratio of success is hard because you don't see it and you have to fish slow. So how do you pick an area and how long do you stay there for? It's one thing when you can like go to Lake Anna and just waypoint, there's a six pounder there, a six pounder there. But when yeah. you're like like on a bay and you're like, I think there's one, I'm just going to wing it and hope to God, like I find five. Like how long do you give yourself in general when you're blind fishing areas? Well, that a lot of that has to come up before a tournament okay. when you're pre-fishing. Okay. If you fish an area, mm. you can you know you're not stressed on mm -hmm. time in pre-fishing. Mm -hmm. You're eliminating eliminating water. water. Yeah. You're eliminating water. That makes water. sense. So, um, you know, it it don't take that long to figure out whether they're in this patch of pads or they're in the next one, because you make five or six casts and you drag something through and you don't get bit, you don't have confidence in them pads anyway. Mm. So you're gonna go to the next set. And just like I found out of five patches down at uh, the chick over the weekend, out of those five patches that were together, I found those fish only in two of them. And that's, and that I, I like because I'm really. Both of yeah. them were next to the main. Okay. Hmm. The ones further back in. But all them fish that I caught were in the back sections of the pads. That, that makes me feel better about my approach to grass because I, mm -hmm. I know we did a um, – and for you guys that really watch all my live streams where I, I talked about tournament approaches and, like, if you want to fish grass, you don't wake out and get out of bed and just do that tournament day. I feel like you can do that with docks or even cypress because, like, my wife and I, we strategize. Mm -hmm. And we could – I went on Google. I was like, yeah, we're going to hit these trees. It's mm -hmm. fine. Grass, I feel like you can't do that game day. It takes so much time to mm -hmm. comb through it to be effective mm -hmm. with that. And that really helps. It really, I, I feel like, I feel more confident in my grass. Like, yeah, you got to put time in and mm -hmm. practice to find the juice. It's mm -hmm. so much to go through game day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really, really good advice for everyone listening. Um, and so I think we're segueing right to the Shenandoah River. Right? Yeah, so um, you live in Shenandoah, so south, um, south of the Shenandoah Valley or southern Shenandoah Valley, I guess you say. Um, and, uh, I had, you know, I know Ray wants to go down and fish. Uh, we're talking town of Shenandoah. Yeah. Little yeah. Town for those who don't know, there's a town yeah. called Shenandoah. Yeah. It's not Shenandoah we, County. Everybody yeah. gets it confused. It's not Shenandoah County. Yeah. It's not Newmarket. No. It's the town Shenandoah. Town of Shenandoah. Yeah. And there's Shenandoah Valley or Shenandoah River. Like, so it's, yeah. it's the town of Shenandoah, which has the Shenandoah River going through it. So, yeah. um, since you live down there, um, what can you tell our viewers about? Uh, that section of the river and where do they where do you specifically put in on the river there? Yeah, normally uh, if if I if I fish the Shandol River, I put in at the the town has a a boat ramp above the dam, which you can put a a big boat in a twenty one foot uh, mm -hmm. like I have, or you can put it in at Egypt Bend. Okay, yeah. uh, they have a boat ramp down there, uh, and then also all over the river. There is places to take out canoes and put mm -hmm. in and launch and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Okay. Um, the actual fishing on the Shandol River is coming back. That's good. Uh, eight to ten years ago, they had a big fish keel. But if you're just somebody that likes to fish and float the river, I would suggest, you know, unless you're going to stop, but if you're going to be moving, I would recommend throw a um, square bill crankbait, uh, a cotton cordell, uh, Smoky Joe, the small one, and if you're in the summertime, you know, just tie on a tiny torpedo or whatever mm -hmm. color you like, um, and you'll have a blast Go to with town. those two baits. Yeah. I can guarantee you, if you ask me what two baits I would take, these would be the two baits I would only take. Mm -hmm. Same uh, colors, or are there other colors uh, if people no, want to spend a little more money? <laughs> yeah, you know, color, in my mind, it's personal preference. How many people have been on the show that says like, like it catches fishermen? Not the fish. yeah. <laughs> he's going to struggle uh, with that because he's all about the color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I keep it simple. If you look in my boat and you look at my worms, it's green punk, <laughs> green punk and red, and black and red. I mean, <laughs> you know, and I got to tell a quick story on color too because it's, I, and I fell into this because. A whopper plopper. I like the loon, which is just the black and the, yeah. it has some it's white in color. it. And uh, I've, I've I got confidence in that. Yeah. Well, Dad, the first time we ever he got the plopper, and the first time we ever started throwing it a long time ago up at Lake Holiday, 
Um, he threw this other, I forget the name of the color, but it's, it's got a gold bottom, but it's got some neat blue on the top and it look, you know, so I went ahead, I don't have that color. So I bought that color cause I saw him catch, you know, four plus pound smallmouth with that. But then I, then I turned it up and looked at it from the way the fish is going to look at it. And all they're going to see is the gold. They're not going to see that blue. They're not yeah. going to, it's not the color, it's the noise. No. But I fell into the same trap. Well, I don't have this color. Even though I'm common black, well, let me go ahead and get this one. Cause this, I've seen this one catch a good fish. Yeah. Well, yeah. but anyway, that's. Well, that's just like, you know, top water, you know, mm. when we was down at Mississippi, I told Jeff said, well, what are you throwing on top water? I said, well, I'm throwing a uh, black buzz bait. He said, well, I'm throwing white. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there you go, yeah. I mean, black and you white, know, yeah. black and white. I yeah. mean, you know, in my mind, when it comes to top water, I think it's all about noise. reaction. Anyway. Yeah, reaction, I, noise. I, I think. Yeah, I, think I don't think yeah. color has anything to do with it. I don't. I agree with it's you. It's unique situations. I think when you're dealing with super pressured fish, like if you guys like I did that uh, Wilkinson Lake video, and the, it's Jane Clear water, and 600 people on it, or you're fishing big swim baits, and it's got to look like mm -hmm. what they're eating. Because they're gonna shark that thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you guys have ever caught one on a big swim bait, they're gonna watch that thing forever before they commit to it. And it's because they're checking that thing out to know if it's if it's the deal. Besides that, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I don't think it it generally matters. But that tiny torpedo, I'd write yeah. about that in woods and waters a lot because it's I had a buddy his one of his kids caught a, a really nice small amount of four plus it? pound. I've never you fished just have a torpedo. back Wait, prop and it's, you, it's got a back prop. I mean this just, this bait is it? very versatile. Okay, you, you can. can just jerk steady it, you wind, can wind it, you it, can okay. jerk it. it. So like I mean, a prop bait on this. Yeah, yeah. So like a prop okay. bait. Prop bait. Huh. It's gonna I mean, stay on top. And... Yep. And then this one right here. I mean, this is the bigger size, but I just got it because it's easier to see. But those are the colors. It's got a black back and white on the side. But that tiny torpedo. No cotton cord. No cotton cord. It might go twelve inches. It might go mm. six. But I'm gonna tell you that little sucker. It'll bounce off mm. all the rocks in the mm. Shandor River. What was the jerk bait they made too? The cotton cord. The um the spot cotton no spot? it was a, not for sure a lot of people that, used but... him for striper all the time um name is redfin i don't know if you ever threw the red that, yeah. i grew up throwing a redfin you know cotton cordell redfin jerk bait you know it's it's no, uh, you're right but... yep it's the yeah but uh what but... is the biggest smallmouth you caught out of the shenandoah out of the shenandoah shoot um maybe four pounds Did you grow up fishing that is that where you're originally from? Is you from born and raised well, there? Well, I was, I, I got into fishing with from my grandfather. Um, he used to take me to the Shenandoah Lake, and then, um, but a lot of my fishing, um, I, I learned on the James River. Okay. Really? My best friend in high school, they had a place down in a place called Ward's Creek okay. on the hmm. James. And I, we spent a lot of time down there catching. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to them down there, it's freckle, not crappy. Mm -hmm. um, but we did it. But I purchased my first boat. And we took it down there. It was a 16 foot Mackey, had a 115 Mercury on it. And uh, I spent a lot of times on the James. Um, so, you know, that's probably where I learned a lot of fishing. Plus, mm -hmm. um, Floating the Shandor River. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. With your experience, I mean, I think you'd be a great person to ask. What do you think about the the life of the James River so far? Like from where it was to where it is now. Like, what, what are it's your better. thoughts on it? Is it better? Like, it's what was better. it used to be like? Uh, before um, the James and the Chick. Here's what I assume of the two. In the James. I think a whole lot more tournaments could be won in the James, but um, but the fish in the James seem to always weigh more than the fish in the chick. Hmm. Hmm. And it's because I think they fight more current in the James. But now, now that they've had all these tournaments, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of... Even it out. It's kind of evened out. Mm -hmm. But I think what helped that whole generation was, you know... Uh, there at Ed Allen's, that dam broke so, quite a few years ago, and there, hmm. and there was a lot of fish have came lot, over. A lot of fish Dropped came in. over hmm. because at one time, a lot of people didn't fish the chick. They remember, I remember when they had the series, the Red Man series. Mm -hmm. Woody Corbin out of Harrisonburg used to fish down there all the time. He said you would go, you might not catch a whole lot of fish on the chick, but you'll catch big ones. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you go to Ed Allen's if you want to catch quite a lot of fish. Yeah. Well, when that dam broke, it seems like the fishing got better and the size got better. Mm. Wow. Interesting. So, um, but yeah, that's, but yeah, one time, the only, only thing to throw on the chick at one time used to be a, a brown worm with an orange tail. Is really? That right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mr. Twister made it. Yeah, okay. It was called natural brown, and it had a little, that little tail it had on it uh -huh. was on curly tail. And, and that's, that's all like, he threw. Huh. That's really cool. Yeah. Now, you uh, you also have experience in other, like Virginia, Virginia lakes. What is your, your favorite Virginia lake to fish? My favorite Virginia lake is probably, I, it's probably a tie. Uh, would I would say more so Kerr, but I like Smith. Smith Mountain. Smith Mountain Lake, and I like Kerr Lake. Why? Well, for one, I'm a dock man. Okay, there it is. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Lake Anna, um, I fish over there, but I, I don't fish as much. I'll drive two and a half hours to fish Smith before I drive an hour and 15 minutes to fish Lake Anna. Hmm. Just because... Um, you know, I just like Smith. Mm -hmm. um, you can get away from more things mm -hmm. at Smith than you Big can at Lake water. Anna. Yeah. More uh, water. And fish my style of water. Mm -hmm. So, and down at Bugs, you know, I just, I like the, you won't see me venture down past Rudd's much. It's from Rudd's up. Hmm. Um, I just... That's where my confidence is when I fish at Bugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my confidence just don't allow me to go down that far. Interesting. You know, that's just me. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So, and then at Smith, you probably won't catch me up past the first turns above Hillsford Bridge. Okay. I just don't get into that river mm -hmm. section of it. What's the key, and you don't have to give away all your secrets, but about being a dock fisherman, to me, I never, maybe it's because where we grew up, we didn't have a lot of docks, because I, I grew up in Northern Virginia, so we fished a lot of grass, a lot of pressured places. If you have six billion docks, I, I mean, how how do you start to break it down if you're in a time crunch? I mean, do you fish every dock and you fish all of it, or are you already eliminating parts of a dock before you even make your first cast? Well, here's my thing. When I put my boat in, I, I, I think about before I get there, and I usually think while I drive. You got to think about your thought process of what time of the year it is. Mm -hmm. And as far as like breaking down docks, when I put my boat in the water, I'm not going to fire it up and run 10 miles. I'm probably going to, pick something there close mm. and I'm going to start mm. and I'm going to start at the front or I'm going to start at the back and work my way out and I'm going to let that first pocket dictate to where I need to fish that is brilliant mm. and I really then like that. Mm -hmm. I mean is it going to be the first three docks going in or do I start at the third dock and, and fish the first four going back or do I go to the ass end and work my way out halfway you know you got to know what's going on before mm -hmm. you start running around on the lake that's mm -hmm. good that's smart that's, yeah and I mean, do you believe yeah. that there's are there, are there right fish because I, I agree with what you're saying there's fish all over that lake are the right fish to win um in a given area in any given area i should say it like that yeah i mean in my you could probably Let's say you run, you could probably go to Smith and, and fish Gills Creek and win a tournament. Okay. But you need to find where that quality is. Right. So there's probably quality. What you're seeing, yeah. you take a section, mm -hmm. there's quality in every section. Yeah. All right. That, that makes sense. How but, many fish do you want to catch? I'm sorry. Let me, I'll let you finish your thought first. But, you know, as, as, as often as you fish the lake, you're always going to have them docks. Oh, yeah that in previous times mm -hmm. that you know you're gonna because you're gonna pre-fish mm -hmm. not those docks really 
you're going to stay away from the docks that because a lot of times before the tournament you probably already know what you're going to run from previous years mm -hmm. you know what docks produce but you just need to find out whether there's where they are right on that dock. on that yeah, dock are true. they at the front yeah. of the dock the middle of the dock is the dock close to the bank and there is no walkway mm -hmm. you know there's or do you have a long walkway and, and out to a dock? That's what blows my mind. If you get some of these like Smith Mountain Lake docks that are a billion dollars and you're like, good Lord, it could take you an hour to hit every pylon. Right. Like, like when you break it up, how many casts, if you, if I put you on a lake you've never been on, just docks, like how long do you spend on, on a dock in that first pocket before you move on to the next one while you're developing your pattern? It, just in general. On average, on a medium sized dock, I'll make four casts. Wow, really? Yeah. On a big dock, I might make, I'll, I'll work both sides because the bigger dock, I don't care how good of a skipper you are, you're not going to skip from one end side to the other. Okay. So, uh, on an average size dock, um, and normally I'm, I'm either going to throw a shaky head or I'm going to throw a chatterbait. You know, forecast on an average dock if you're a good sk skipper. You know, you can skip a chatterbait plumb across the whole lake, whole underneath of a dock. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I can do it, so I know Jeff can. And, you know, what you need to find out is there's certain, like Smith Mountain Lake, I was having trouble locating the fish on the docks one day. And so I called Jeff and he said, well, well remember this, Rick, remember when we were down there? We were catching the fish on docks that were right next to the bank. Mm. And when he told me that, that's when the bell went off and, you know, hmm. started, I started, I got back into them. So that just. And to your point, so that dock could be, there's the docks that are closest to the bank, but yeah. then is that fish on the back the pylons? The back side of the, the dock. back pylons, or is it yeah. on the front? I mean, I yeah. guess it could be different. He's in the back section. Okay. Yeah, he's going to be in that back section. So okay. closest to the bank is in the part of the dock that's closest yeah. to the bank. Because I guess it wouldn't be a dock. And there's to the and, bank. and also there's rock. Okay. That's and then what you're looking how for. many do you want where you feel like, I'm good, I'm dialed in? Do you just want one bite to clue you in? I know all pros have their own idea. Like, how many bites do you want to have to where you're like, we're good? Well, you know, if, if you fish, let's say four or five docks and they, and they all come out of the same spot, you're dialed in. Okay. I mean... I, 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 I was, I remember one time Jeff was so dialed in, he, he could tell you, go to this dock and he, he would skip a jig and he would get bit. Wow. Do I you mean, guys roll your hooks then in practice? Is that generally mm -hmm. what you guys that's, do? And that's what you, okay. you know, being a dock fisherman, that's what you're looking for, you know. Okay. You're eliminating water and you're eliminating docks and you just run, 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 run. And you might so, fish. Hundred docks in a day. I've been going too slow. I now day two, problem. day crazy. two though that doesn't set up. That dock doesn't set up. How, like are you to his point too? So if you're not, if it's not producing, not working, you've tried your close docks, you're out, and it doesn't seem to be a dock bite. Are you? What are you rolling to next? How do you determine what the next plan B is? Well, in my experience in fishing, there's always. I mean, like let's say a Smith Mountain Lake then you either, they're either gonna be on the shaky head because see, you're throwing both, but you're gonna cover them docks on moving baits. Gotcha. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change up. If I'm if slow I'm not down. getting bit on, I'm gonna slow down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna pick up a chatter, or a shaky head, or I might flip a jig or skip a jig. But you'll stay with that dock. But I'll stay with that that's dock. That's your confidence. That's my confidence. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna change, from a moving bait to a slow, slow bait. bait. Now, if I fish half a day and I ain't got bit, then I'm probably gonna, uh, or if I go through a pocket and I, let's say I fish that whole pocket with a chatter bait and I catch no fish, I'm probably gonna change baits and I'm gonna fish that pocket again. So hmm, you get like you get dumped on a lake you've never been before. I love it. Step one, I'm not running a thousand miles. I'm gonna stay where I launched. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna fish that pocket with one bait and then I'm gonna go back through there again. 
just the time save. So I've mm -hmm. already completely done everything completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So first off, I'm going too slow, picking apart every dock like I'm a surgeon when I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And then I love the idea that don't just drive somewhere, mm -hmm. just fish Figure the docks around you. It's yeah. just so brilliant. Or, or fish something close. I yeah. mean, you know, nothing says you put in down here and you go run to the other end of the lake because mm -hmm. you just want to hear, hear your boat run. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do see. that, just leave the rods at home and just go ride in the boat. <laughs> I mean, uh, amen. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's building that confidence yeah. and, you know, over the years of fishing, um, you know, if, if you're wanting to fish the middle section of the lake, put your boat in the middle section of the lake. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to hear your boat run, put in up here and then run to the middle of the boat. But, you know, just like, you know, when I go down to bugs, most of the time I put in ruts because okay. that's that area that I mm -hmm. like to fish. And if I'm going to fish in the upper end towards Buffalo or some of the places up there, then I'll put in at the back end of Bluestone. Hmm. How do you, so when I fished the national championship down at, at Kiwi uh, a couple of years ago for college, I got to face floating docks for the first time. And growing up in the tidal Potomac River, I didn't know you could have floating docks like they had with all the cabling and stuff. Do they hold differently in general on on floating compared to pylon? And if if you have a, a mess of them, do you specifically look for ones that have pilings drilled in there? Like, how do you approach like the whole floating yeah, dock? That bugs thing? that bugs dock is different than like than like a Smith Mountain Lake or yeah. Lake Anna. Smith Mountain, yeah. yeah. Well, think of this. Think of shade. So where are them fish are going to be? Uh, okay. So you got to find some. So you're you you already know you're taking out fish in the bottom because then fish there. will be suspended okay so interesting you can think of chatterbait throwing a spinner bait down along the side mm, and letting it sink below it or a fluke hmm. um that's interesting uh you know just a bait that you know it don't have to go to the bottom that's I mean, interesting so you're not fi you're fishing below them almost you're, you're fishing below the dock just like yeah. Uh, me and Melvin, we fished the Angler's Choice Championship. See, I used to fish Angler's Choice Team Trail. Um, we did very good that weekend, and we probably could have done a whole lot better if we just went over to them other docks. But a lot of them were floaters. Okay. And what we were doing was flipping the chatterbait and letting it sink and then start reeling it back real close. But I'm talking holding tight holding it tight to that them mm -hmm. floaters get them to come out yeah to get them to come it. out because they'll come out but mm, you want to be about a foot below that floater that's that's I a, love yeah it. it's so simple to think about it like if you're trying to throw a shaky head on a floating dock you're just fishing underneath them you're fishing right. underneath they're of suspended. it yeah they're suspended yeah so that's just like wow and i love we're talking off camera again the thing i like about Ricky is he's very detail oriented mm -hmm. um but not and, crazy and, but he's not <laughs> He doesn't go off yeah. the cliff, yeah. and he's simple in in his approach. Mm -hmm. He doesn't overthink it, and so that combination of detail oriented and how he's rigging stuff and how he's working it, but not overcomplicating it. That that sweet spot right there is I, I love that about the way you've broken down this stuff. Well, thank you, and because you can't, you can go too far. Yeah. Oh too yeah, far you can overthink. You're like you're overthinking. You can go in the you're overthinking, hole. and then, mm -hmm. and fishing's not about being overthinking or being or being pretty. You know, a lot of people say if you show somebody a crankbait, especially like a woman, oh, that's a pretty <laughs> crankbait. Well, I mean, it might be pretty to you, but you know. Purdy don't always work. Mm -hmm. And to you, it's a tool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tool. Use the right tool to yep. get what you I have need a tackle to get box fish. and you have a toolbox. Tool, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, so I, I have one more question yeah. then to make sure yeah. we don't wrap up. It's like, what, what got you onto the chatterbait? And like before the chatterbait, were you were you a spinnerbait guy or like what what was your big aha moment that that first introduced you to the chatterbait? Well, what was neat about the chatterbait is there's versatile things you can do with a chatterbait mm -hmm. just like you can a spinnerbait um i have a spinnerbait and jeff knows it very well i call it money <laughs> and what's good about this spinnerbait is it has a, a wrap belly on it and goes up into a v hmm. i like you know how some spinnerbaits 
when you throw them, I mean, because I do a lot of things with a spinner bait. You can flutter them, but if you ever flipped one and let it drop straight down, mm -hmm. the spinner bait that I have, I, I like to throw, it don't roll. It don't roll to the side when you drop it straight down. Hmm. Just like down at Smith, when you're on a, like a chatterbait bite and you want to do something just a little different, I'll throw my spinner bait up next to the poles and it'll flutter as it goes down and that mm. head does this. Mm, almost like a, a, a blade Kind of like a helicopter. Yeah. Mm, wow. It does that as it goes down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, that's deadly in its own. Are they hitting it on the fall, fall. or is it once you start that mm -hmm. second or third turn yep. on the fall? Yeah. Hmm. And, um, and I'll change my blades, blades compared to the size of your bait. But uh, but no, a chatterbait. That's, I mean, you can you can work it like a regular jig. Jig. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know. I've talked to guys that they'll leave it yep. on the bottom like a jig. Yep. And then you and can then just pop, pop it. it, and it gets a flutter. Yep. And, yep. You're you're right. And a lot yep. of people don't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't do it in it, but it is. And you're right. And any you can keep that that presentation on, and you can fish it four or five different ways. Mm -hmm. And in the water column, and speeds and techniques, and you, it's like you said, it's very versatile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, just like, you know, I have a lot of different things, just like my spinner bait. I don't throw trailer hooks on it. My buzz bait, I don't put a trailer hook on it. Wow, really? I mean, you know, just like my line. Trailer hook, do you, do you put trailers or not? Like a you know, I'll put trail, I have trailers, but like on my spinner bait yes. that I like to throw, don't, yeah. some people put a, a trailer yeah. hook on it. I just prefer not to. Right. Hmm. Uh, for one thing, it's just another hook to get yeah. caught on something. Mm -hmm. um, and the, now I put a trailer on chatterbait, ultra vibes, um, which give it more. Mm -hmm. And and I put and I mostly use Zoom um, trailers. Um, uh, Z Man's got some good mm -hmm. trailers for the for the chatterbait if. And the thing about it is if, if you're going over, let's say you're fishing a lot of wood with a chatterbait, mm -hmm. a different style trailer will keep your chatterbait from hanging up. Mm -hmm. Like if you go with the flat wide ones, mm -hmm. that'll keep your bait upright so it don't roll over and hang. If uh, you're throwing open water, you get a paddle tail. Mm -hmm. Z-Man makes quite a few good paddle tails. Mm -hmm. And then if you're just throwing anything, just put some ultra vibes on. Mm -hmm. So then, when would you, again, broad brush strokes, when would you throw a swim jig, a spinnerbait, and a chatterbait, or is it just like, it's just what you feel confidence in? Or is it, is one replacing the other? Like, it's so weird, because like we always talk about, you got two hands and one rod. So kids flipping the Bassmaster magazine, they say, like, okay, well, there's like 5,000 baits, and like sometimes you feel like there's overlap between the techniques. Yeah. Well, you know, it. there again, you, you almost got to let your fish dictate, mm -hmm. okay. you know, how aggressive they are. Just like when I fished Gunnersville, we were throwing 12 inch swim baits. Mm -hmm. Goodness Dude, gracious. Dude, I ain't never threw 12 inch <laughs> swim baits before. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, but the style eating. of fishing that we were doing, mm -hmm. you know, I've been fishing long enough that it don't take, you know, the average fisherman would take a while to get to learn how to throw a, mm -hmm. a bigger bait. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were throwing it under bridges. And that's where the fish was at Gunnersville. But I mean, it was like you had to let these things go to the bottom. Then you click mm -hmm. your bail, and then you just start slow, mm -hmm. cranking them back to the boat. And I'm when they hit, I mean, they just almost jerk your hands out, mm -hmm. rod out of your hands. But you know, you're throwing, you know, eight, nine, ten dollar swim baits. Mm -hmm. So, but you know it. Well, yeah, I've thrown like the doc turned me on to the, the baby menace on the back of a um, on the river on the mm -hmm. Susquehanna River, yeah. and I've tried on the lakes too, and it is very effective. So back, you know, whether you do a paddle tail, you know, going this way or this way, you know, both will work. Yeah, um, I'll throw a missile. You know, I know Cruz was uh, well, Cruz and Schmidt both have thrown the missile as a trailer on that too, the four and a half or six inch. Um, what is that one called? Uh, it's not the, the menace? Ned Bomb, no. Um, um, it's like a Senko, but it's got the, I'm drawing a blank. The split tail. But right. 
Yeah. Anyway, that that's also been effective. So yeah. I mean, just experimenting with them too. Yeah, you can, and that's yeah. pretty much you know you, what you're confident in. Yeah, it's what you're confident in, and what and what works for you. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you can take, you know, five people and give them chatter baits, mm-hmm. but all five of them probably gonna find a different trailer that mm-hmm. they like. Right. That's right. You know, because and they all work. Works. Because and they yeah, all and they work all for work. them because yeah. Yeah, yeah but that's just. Personal you know, preference. Personal preference. Yes. And you, you hit the nail on the head in one of our earlier inter- interviews, which was like you put five different people on a lake and mm-hmm. they can all wreck them and mm-hmm. finish in the top five mm-hmm. and they could all five do something completely something different. different. Yeah, different color, different mm-hmm. presentation, whatever. And, and then there's other times where it does, there is one, like you were saying on that, I mean, it's obvious too. Yeah, other guys might have caught them, but not not everybody won. Like you won them with a slow technique. The yeah. ones that were so persistent and never stopped to slow down, and kept grinding, thinking it's going to turn on, and it never did. You struck out that time, but being mm-hmm. able to say they're not catching anything, they're still winding. Let's go ahead and just blow this thing. Yeah. Let's soak it, and and you don't get you may not even get a lot of bites in those cases, but it, it's the right bites. Yeah, and the, and the thing about slow. Guy told me one time. He said, "When you think you're slow, you're not slow enough." Right. I've been yelled at that. Once well, twice. I'm gonna tell you too. I don't know how many times it's that. Like you might have said earlier too, but you throw it out, and you're doing something different. Mm-hmm. Like you know, you're cleaning your glasses or your, mm-hmm. you know, your phone. You know, in in the time that you're doing that, if 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 I'm here, I'm like constantly working and I can't. I'm fidgety. Whereas if if I'm distracted and it's just sitting there, it's that do nothing technique. Yep. It's a do nothing. Yeah. And the yeah. times where you're doing nothing where you had the backlash and you're doing this number, you get back up. Oh my God, there's a fish on there. Right. And you haven't done anything with it. You just mm-hmm. threw it in there and let it soak. You know, sometimes yeah. that's when you get bit, uh, yeah. forcing ourselves to slow down can be hard. I mean, a lot of truth to that statement. I think oh, that's yeah. what separates like everyone else from the elite anglers is it usually a person specializes in one or the other. So mm-hmm. you give a Kevin Van Dam who drops the water mm-hmm. and you, you you have angler B that, that soaks it and then you have these anglers that are able to do both. It mm-hmm. feels like it's hard to do. Like you can get really, you can get the mindset to be able to mm-hmm. soak or go fast, mm-hmm. but it's so hard to balance between oh, yeah, and have is. the conditioning. It's difficult to be disciplined uh, in your mind to, to do that, tell your body, your mind, and then your body to actually do it. And yeah. cause sometimes too, when you're not getting bit, you get, you feel like you got to do more. Yeah. Well, maybe you should be doing less, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, you know, fishing is, is, is just don't o- overcomplicate mm-hmm. it. I mean, that's the easiest thing I can tell yeah, any, right. any, any beginner, you know, you can watch all this stuff you want on TV, but you know, stick with something simple, you know, you know, everybody starts with a bobber and live bait, Mm -hmm. you know, progress from there, you know, maybe throw, you know, a pop R to learn how to fish top water, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, crank baits, you know, maybe go to the river, you know, Mm -hmm. like I said, and and learn to throw a crank bait. And, you know, as far as worm fishing, that's going to, that's a, that's all in in the hands. So, uh, but you know, just keep it simple. So now that you are now that you're uh, famous, what uh-huh. is what, what are some of your goals this year and next year with with with, with, uh, with the hardware you have and the, the nice uh, the nice payday? Well, you know, I try not to think about that. Um, you know, I, it's like I said. You know, I've been fishing tournaments for probably close to thirty years. And it's not the success that I look at. Hmm. It's the competition, hmm. you know. That's what I. That's what I. I like. Mm-hmm. The, I like the idea of the competition, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's nice to win, um, you know, and 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 get from the benefits. Mm-hmm. But as far as you know, what I want to accomplish the rest of the year, I don't know how I can beat it. Well, you got yeah. you got to go to the you got to go to the other side of the boat next time. That's what you yeah. got. Well, yeah, M- what move to the front? <laughs> yeah, move to the front now. <laughs> yeah, you fished well, one tournament at the back, yeah. and then you won it. So. How old are you now? How old are you? I'm 58. I 58. turned 59 in June. You're still young. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe I need to make my goal to win the second one. Yes, that's right. I like that yeah. one. Um, I don't know if anybody's won. 
two in a row in the same year. Actually, I don't think so. I don't know. I ain't never did enough research, but no, I mean, you know, I would love to, my, my biggest goal this, the rest of the year is probably to try to win the Fishers of Men points with Melvin. Okay. Um, you know, get, get that would be a nice accomplishment. And, and there's two year. Fishers of Men. Is there like an East and, and then a, a West? Yeah. We're fishing the Eastern division. Eastern. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so you're, fish, you're sitting in second right now. You yeah. Said. We're sitting yeah, in second. So it's definitely attainable. Yeah. So, you know, we just got to have two good finishes and, mm -hmm. um, so, and they're both of them. One's on the James and the other one's on the Chick. I was going to say, what's your next one? Yeah. The is James. The James. Okay. Yeah, we're going out of Hopewell Marine. Okay. They're at Mouth Athematics, and then we'll probably go out of Rock a Hawk uh, because somebody said you can't even launch a boat at the hideaway unless you're either um, staying at the motel or, huh. mm -hmm. or camping. Interesting. I think that's where I stayed for our our last little ordeal mm -hmm. down there too. Mm -hmm. So I mean, what do you what do you when is your next tournament? What do you think the weights are going to be like for, for that time of year? Is it is it coming up shortly? Well, I'm going to say like the James coming up. I'm going to say to win with what I found out down there this weekend. I'm going to say fifteen to seventeen pounds. Okay. And then for you guys to feel comfortable in points, where do you think you have to be like a good weight a good, for you guys? A good weight for us. If you left the tournament, what do you feel satisfied with? It's not the win. If we left the tournament, if we go down there and catch 13 pounds, okay, I'll feel comfortable with that. Okay. Those weights now, are crazy down there mm, man, right now. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think me and Melvin, you know, we got next Friday – so I think between the two of us, we can figure something out. Figure something out. Uh, we already got half the puzzle possibly mm -hmm. figured out. Mm -hmm. We just need to find mm -hmm. the other half of the pie. I think this is your year. I think you're going to just just mop the field up. Well, oh, I don't. I don't want. Yeah, <laughs> but I tell you too, and I yeah. just I, we were talking before again off camera that you know just what a great sport yeah. to where yeah. you know you can fish these different series. Uh, from a local club to fishers of men and then but then get into an open yeah mm -hmm. and fish at that at that high level with those guys there's yep. no other sport i've said this before and I, I didn't make this up i heard it from some of the pros there's no other sport that you can go in and compete at that level yep. and and mm -hmm. uh and compete with them yeah and and walk away with a trophy like that you know in mississippi and then you know it's just it's just a great sport. It really is. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, the people you meet along the way, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you can start here mm -hmm. and you can end here. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, at the top of the pinnacle mm -hmm. and go to the classic. That's right. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Yes, it doesn't yeah. matter how old you are. I mean, yep. I mean, look at Rick Clun. Rick Clun earlier. Yeah. That's, Rick Clun yeah. is never too late to, yep. you know. And you can keep learning. I, oh, yeah. I, I listened to a podcast with, um, with, with him, I think it was, it was Bass Talk Live, where, where Rick asked one of these younger guys to go out in his boat and teach him forward-facing sonar at his age. And song. he's going out there learning how to throw a jerk bait with forward-facing sonar because <laughs> he funny. just he wants to learn it. Wants and to learn this new, At yeah. his age, and he's still out there still like doing it. it. It's, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's so well, fascinating. funny thing you talked about that is we were at the Suzuki <laughs> trailer. Um, one of the guys was getting a sensor replaced on his Yamaha. I'm sorry, I said Suzuki, didn't I? I mean, Yamaha trailer. And Zell Rowland was there. And and Zell Rowland said, you know, I'd like to take these guys out and see if they knew how to operate a flasher. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a lot of them would say, what? Yeah. what? What's a flasher? Yeah, what's what are you a talking flasher? about? What's a flasher? But, you know, and, and another thing I will tell a lot of people, you know, there's going to be certain times of the year where that graph ain't going to do you no good. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta be able to fish without it. You gotta yeah, be able to stage. fish without yeah. it. Okay, well, I'd be good like to ask you this. Like, so, what is your opinion about that? And you don't have to answer this either about forward-facing sonar and tournaments and stuff. Do you feel like you? It, is it a time and a place that it's good, or is technology getting a little too crazy? Uh, no, I mean in the springtime. But you know, I say that, and they've done already proved that with the with the Humminbird 360, they can see a fish on bed. Mm -hmm. So, mm. you know, yeah, you can, but when I say, 
I forward all that stuff is good, like in the early spring when, especially suspending fish, when you're throwing an A rig. Oh, yeah. You know, you can, you know, and I've mm. done seen it, you can wind an A rig and all that stuff. You can see them fish rise on it. Mm -hmm. And you see your bait, and then you see the fish covered mm -hmm. up, and it's just, all you're doing now is just waiting on the hook set mm -hmm. or wait for it to jerk on the rod. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I still say, you know, don't always rely on something that you can't see below you. Mm. I had, uh, we had Travis Luger's episode, uh, We ha I had him on the show last week, and it's dropping uh, actually before, after this one came out. But I talked to him about forward facing sonar. He said, I love it because people left the bank and it leaves the docks open for me. Mm. Like, do you see in, in more tournaments that people are, or is it just the same as always? Or, but are more people leaving the bank and trying to do this whole offshore thing? Has that actually opened up a whole new bite? Oh, yeah. Really? Yep. I know a lot of people that are starting to look for more offshore things. Mm -hmm. And see, there again, that's what I'm talking about. Mm. There's going to be certain times of the year mm -hmm. where them fish ain't on them brush piles. Right. It's not always I mean, they work. don't yeah. they don't spawn in 15 and 20 feet of water. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember the lenders talked about that. Lender was talking. They were talking about that. You know, I guess Wisconsin or whatever. When the, you know, when the last technology came out, down image or whatever it was, it was like you know they they knew that body of water and they fished it, and made a living at it. Um, what it did allow, and they to your point, they they found fish they never found before mm -hmm. in places to fish that they never knew were there. Mm -hmm. And so it yeah. did get you out of that kind of habitual routine habit. I'm going to fish here. I, and so I it does mean, push you out yeah. a little bit. I think the key, and I've heard, you know, let's watch the elite guys too. I mean, look, Jason Christie, I mean, he he might have used it a little bit, but he there's times too, he's just going to go fish. Yeah. He turns it off. So, yeah. and even the guys are using it, I think they're 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 also realizing just like everything, it's a tool. It's a tool. Mm -hmm. Kind of like your power poles. They'll yeah. work in certain conditions or certain situations, but you're not going to use them in other situations. Yeah. Same sort of thing where they will help you find fish, but I think everybody agrees too. Nobody wants to be here all the time they they want to get their head up and start looking like you said before mm -hmm. looking around yeah and watching the people are watching seeing oh i see a you know might be laying right there um i think it's, it's big finding on, a yeah. combination yeah. they're not and, just being drilled to that or stuck to that glued to that all the time yeah. and you know you can use it as a tool and say oh there are fish under this thing let's see oh yeah yeah and i and i personally think because i'm neutral on it i think it's i think it really comes down to not the technology but the tournament directors right if all you do is go to Kentucky Lake in July or Blueback right. Herring Lake, yeah, you're going to show off the technology. Right. But if you have a good blended schedule mm -hmm. where yeah. you've got a little bit of everything, I think that's fine. When I think mm -hmm. when Forward Facing Center came on the scene, the tournament set up mm -hmm. to where, yeah, if you didn't have that and you're going to mm -hmm. Lake Murray in the fall, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to just completely, or Lake Fork in the fall mm -hmm. where you're doing that. But if you go to the Sabine River mm -hmm. or Florida, like you take mm -hmm. that away. I mean, right. like, like look at what John Cox did. So I do think it's like, it's up to the mm -hmm. tournament scheduler to make sure you mm -hmm. blend it so you don't mm -hmm. give one person too much of a home right. field advantage. Right, in right. baseball, yeah. same thing. Same thing. Yeah. yeah, keeping it neutral. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, if you, if you look at it, most of your Japanese fishermen, are the ones that are. I love watching that guy. Whoever I I I, I don't want to butcher you his think name. Using it James, or? No, yeah. they're they're the they're the main ones. It, I mean, just look at the classic. I mean, mm -hmm. the one guy. Well, uh, what Matty Wong I think was. Yeah, um, but he he was one talking about not using it, like yeah. not. It, it, Watching them because I like to form my pattern around it. It's their thought process, and I, they had a they had a. I was watching these Japanese videos with this transition, and the idea is like they don't look for fish, they just try to get them to bite because their mindset is they come from a place that has two lakes, so you know that this is the spot. So instead of running around to find fish, you go to the honey hole and you, you just figure them, them out, eat, yeah. and then you watch them and how they fish the James mm -hmm. and Chick like Chickamauga. They go to these spots that everyone knows about, and they just figure them out. And, they don't run around. And it's almost too though, like it's it, it is. They, like you said, you can drop that a rig, and I can drop. You could drop it right down on them, mm -hmm. and then and they're and they're gonna bite. And we see the times they do bite, but it's kind of like a bed fish. Mm -hmm. You yeah. can go in and see that bed fish, and you could flip on her for you know forty five minutes an hour, yeah. and she may not bite. Yep. She might pick it up in a move. Mm -hmm. There's it's still. Does it help? Yes. Are you gonna oh, catch yeah, fish does. you wouldn't have? Yes, because you're gonna know yeah. they're there. Does it work all to your point? Is it going to work no. all the time? No. no, it's not always going to. No, you know, no. there's going to be certain boat. times of the year where all them fish 
Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to be on the banks. Mm-hmm. It's definitely different, though. It's yeah. definitely not what oh, it's, my thing was, too, is if you – if those guys, your Hank Parkers and, and those guys, Bill Dance back in the day would have had that stuff. Oh, man. Or how could they compete yeah. today? That'd be my question. How could they? And I don't know. Like I say, you got to <coughs> – I think you would still compete. Cause it's, yeah. It's the same thing with power poles. Because yeah. I remember I fought, like, getting power poles for the mm-hmm. longest time. But now that I have them, my God, I couldn't imagine fishing shallow without them. Like, so yeah. it's, it's the same thing, I think. Yep, yeah, because, I mean, you know, especially when the wind's gale. Oh, my goodness, yeah. yeah. You know, you can move four feet at a time, mm-hmm. just like, you know, on a chick. Or even how many times you, and like, then, dock and undock your boats yeah. just to put them down real quick when you launch by yourself. Yeah. But, and I remember people talking about that, like, you don't need them to win back in the day. Right. Nowadays, I would I would die before I get yeah. rid of my poles. Yeah. Oh, I I never had power poles till I had this one. Uh-huh. This mm-hmm. new, the new boat, you know, I had a TR-196. Mm-hmm. I didn't have power poles on it. And what I used to do is just every time I was in the grass, I'd trim my big motor up, then trim my big motor down. Mm, that's neat. Okay. That's what I used <laughs> just to lock myself in the grass or gotcha. in the pads or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, but then when I got to power poles, you know, yeah. it just made the features a whole lot easier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. I was thinking earlier the, when I was trying to come up with that trailer, the missile quiver. Quiver. I mm-hmm. met yeah. one with just the quiver, like. Um, there's different things you can do with that too and then uh but cruz had it on as a trailer on his chatterbait and i've tried that and that's also uh, he's got you know it's, it's a little more subtle yeah uh, and again just something different i mean oh, yeah. and everybody's always looking for different though mm-hmm. something yeah. different so it's, it's so interesting because i grew up like i always like when i did tournaments with a trailer hook i always kept it on the brim of my hat mm. and so if i was fishing a spinnerbait or a chatterbait mm-hmm. like we were fishing the chesapeake and we got short strike real mm-hmm. quick that was the first thing we did we just pop it off and throw it on real quick but it's just so interesting to realize like that's a hot topic among mm-hmm. fishermen if you ask 10 people mm-hmm. it might be split down the yeah, middle about it. trailer I hooks i don't use them so i don't know it's just it's so interesting after yeah. doing this like people's opinions on those yeah. things well, Ricky, I've seen you around the store, yeah. and uh, you know it's. Uh, but we, we've just talked briefly, yep. you know, in passing. But uh, again, in this industry, the circles. Mm-hmm. We were talking about kayakers and those that knew Nolan, and the, um, you know, the the circles they kind of overlap, and and the mutual friendships mm-hmm. and uh, relationships, and. Um, but I, I, congratulations! I mean, that's again bringing that Virginia boy bringing congratulations. Back that's home awesome, as a dude. Co-angler. That's so awesome. Yeah. And thank you for coming in too yeah. and sharing um, your knowledge and what you know, and and that's that's also really awesome mm-hmm. because um, I know we enjoy it. We enjoy listening and hearing oh, yeah. and just you know how you mentally break that down. Uh, that's that's good stuff. And then I, so I know the viewers too that are watching. Um, I'm getting a lot of good feedback from people coming in. They're enjoying it, you know. And so uh, and and the the thing with his hand too, the fingers. I mean it's, that to me is yeah. You know, people, it's yeah, more, and again, that's another, that's another thing too, that makes that so much, that's oh, just yeah. such a, it's not, most people would not have fished. They would have said, nope, I can't, you know, cause rehab is not oh, yeah. easy. No. I don't care whatever you've done, no. you've done a shoulder or a knee or you've been yeah. through it and rehab is not an mm-hmm. easy thing. And the way you're you practicing like the hook setting. Window. Yes. It's like a Rocky montage yeah. before you get so ready for the fight. Just getting this, like, yeah. It's just, it's, so, I mean, it's, what's, what's Mike Iaconelli say? Never give up. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that is a <laughs> great right line that. to end yeah. on. Um, yeah. Ricky, like, we'll how, have him back. I need to have him yeah, back. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. How can people follow you, or do you want any media attention, paparazzi on you? Oh, I mean, thing? you can, yeah, I can be me, uh, emailed. Um, I mean, I my phone number, if somebody, you know, has a question, if I can help somebody out in any way, mm-hmm. I got no secrets. That's cool. I mean, you know. I might not tell you where I'm fishing. That's right. Mm-hmm. But I might tell you the baits. Right. You know, if you ask me, because I can tell you, you know, most of the people, they already going to know where I'm at right. it, anyway yeah. over the years. Yeah. I mean, and but, you, you, you know, know a if, guy. I can, yeah. if I can help somebody out, I will. That's pretty I got cool. no problem with that. And you know a guy when you can talk philosophy, fishing philosophy, because I think that's the next level is people want to know baits, but yeah. then like, you know, you're, you're listening to a good conversation with like strategies. Yes. What's like going that's, through your mind. that's next yeah, how, level. Why you're throwing it. Yes. Just what you're throwing. Why are yeah. you throwing it? Why are you, you throwing it? Exactly. How are you yeah. approaching this body of water? And just mm-hmm. the details, guys, when you talk about like, I didn't care about necessarily the baits he fished docks. What just wired me into his approach to fishing jocks, because mm-hmm. that is yes. when you're talking to people, that's the next level. 
everyone has their own baits they like to throw, mm. like depending on the situation. So that I don't think is as important, but the mindset of a winner and their mm. approach, that is just valuable. And, and that's oh, next level stuff. That is, I like it. And so guys, again, please like and subscribe to the channel. Um, a link in the episode description to everything that you need to go. Please come out to Jake's Bait and Tackle in Winchester, Virginia, if you ever want to see one of the best sporting goods stores and fishing stores around. And again, please, like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time. We are the largest and fastest growing outdoor fishing show in the greater DC metro area. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.